we know that if we have a function that's one to one, then there's a bijection between the domain of that function and the image of that function, which means that there exists an inverse for that function. Now, we already know that it's not necessarily true that if we have a continuous function on some domain, then there's an inverse function that's also continuous. We have to assume some additional properties of that function. Similarly, we don't necessarily know that even if a function has a continuous inverse on its image, that it's necessarily differentiable if the initial function was differentiable. And so right now, we'll study the situation where if we assume the function, the inverse function is indeed differentiable, then we can find a formula, an explicit formula, for the differential of that inverse. So we'll state this as a theorem, and we'll let A be an open subset of Rn. We'll let C be a point in A, and we'll assume that we have a function that's differentiable at C. And suppose there exist open sets U and V such that C is contained in U is a subset of A and f of u equals v and an inverse function and there exists an inverse function g from v to rn satisfying the condition that when we compose these two functions, we get back the identity on both their domains. In other words, f and g are inverses of each other. With this assumption, then we can say that the differential of g at the image of f c is equal to the differential of f at c after taking its inverse. And the proof of this is actually very, very, very simple if we use diagrams. So we'll give this proof. And in order to make sense of it, what we should look at is the following diagram. These two equations that describe to us the fact that f and g are inverses of each other are consequences of a commutative diagram. And what commutative diagram is that? Well, let's just write out f and g uh, as compositions. So if we start out with their domains, then we have that f is a function from u to v, g is a function from v to u, and this composition being the identity at u is exactly what this right equation is telling us. And the left equation is telling us that if we do this in reverse, and we take g and then apply f, then that's going to give us the identity at v. So by assumption, we should say this. By assumption, the diagrams this and this both commute. And I forgot to mention here that not only do we assume that these functions are inverses of each other, but this equation wouldn't even make sense if we didn't assume that g was differentiable at f of c. So we should, we should include that as well. Um, satisfying, first let's assume that um, g is differentiable at f of c and these two conditions hold. Now the statement of the theorem makes sense. So applying the chain rule, 
to both of these diagrams gives us two new diagrams. Here initially we were talking about open subsets of Rn and functions between those open subsets. When we apply the chain rule, what we're doing is we're sort of transforming these open subsets of Rn and then we're looking at linear transformations, linear approximations to these functions. And so what we get is since u is a subset of Rn and so is v, then all of these entries become Rn. And we're evaluating, you were using the chain rule by evaluating the differentials at the appropriate points. So for f, we assume that it, the function is differentiable at c. And then by the chain rule, we're looking at the image of f, and then we're taking the differential of g at the point fc. And the chain rule says that diagrams like this always commute. And that means that this composition is equal to what's the differential of the identity function? The identity function is an example of a linear function restricted to a domain. And because the differential of a linear transformation is the linear transformation itself, this is also just the identity. So I didn't write all of that down, but you should be able to know that that's the reason why I'm writing the identity here. So this and similarly, we have another diagram here by applying the differential. And this time the differential is applied, is, is applied to um, FCG. And here we have df. Now, here we're looking at the image of f of c under g. But the image of f of c under g, because f and g are inverses, is c again. So this is still dcf. And the same argument here tells us that the identity function is at the bottom. So the chain rule says that these two diagrams commute. What does that mean? Well, if I look at just what each of these diagrams mean separately, this says that d f c g composed with d c f is equal to the identity linear transformation. So think about this as one sort of object. If you wanted to, we can call this linear transformation, for example, t, and this one s. So this says t s is the identity. And similarly, this diagram commuting tells us that dcf composed with dfcg, d of g at fc, rather, is equal to the identity in Rn. And this, if we use the same notation t and s, says s and t gives me the identity. Right, the identity um, linear transformation. So what we have is two linear transformations such that when we compose them in this order, give us the identity transformation in both directions. This is equivalent to the definition of a linear transformation being an isomorphism. In other words, an invertible linear transformation. And because of this, both of these equations, actually technically one of them is sufficient uh, when we're dealing with finite dimensional uh, linear transformations. Linear transformations between vector spaces of finite dimension. If we're dealing with infinite dimensional vector spaces, then both of these conditions will be required. Regardless, um, both of these conditions imply that t is equal to the inverse of s. And if we plug back in what t and s are, we'll get exactly this equation. So that's actually the end of the proof. And it's an incredibly simple proof that's just using the chain rule and using diagrams from the chain rule.